Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? I hope you can. I hope you can. Um, thanks for joining us today um, on a really, really chilly November evening. Um, winter really has come already. Um, so today we're going to be talking about two reflective models. Uh, my name is Holly. I am currently an, uh, an NHS assistant psychologist and uh, I found that using lots of different reflective models helps me think about my experiences differently. Thank you. Hi guys. Okay, um, don't forget to follow us on all the social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, we've got two Facebook groups as well. One is for Clinical Psychology Community UK and the other one is for our DeclinSci Applicants Reflective Space. Let me know if you've got any questions as we go through in the chat. Um, I'll try and keep half an eye on it, but we do have a section for question, questions and answers later. Okay, so if anyone's happy to share in the comments, um, let me know what room you're in, what experience you've got of using reflective models. Um, let me know in the comments if you're watching this as a record, so it's really helpful to know um, what experience levels people, people have. But today we are going to look at, um, a, well, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to reflective models, um, and we're going to outline, um, give you an example, and then we're going to critique the Gibbs model and the Brookfield model as well. And then I'll compare the two and we'll have a Q&A section. Okay. If you are interested, there is a full webinar, full free webinar on, on my YouTube channel um, that is all focused on reflective practice and introducing exactly what reflective models are, how to do it, all of that stuff. But briefly, reflective models provide a framework for reflective practice. So it, it often is in the form of a cycle, but it has prompts and questions to guide you and think differently about the experience that you're reflecting on and the experience that you've had. Um, and also they can be from different disciplines. Um, so a lot of the time they are from sort of psychology disciplines, uh, but uh, equally one of the ones we're looking at today, Brookfield, is from an education um, point of view. Uh, so yeah, as I say, lots of different disciplines in there, but they can be um, applied to lots of different situations and settings as well. So let's look, move on to our first model of the evening. Um, it's the Gibbs model, 1988. This is probably the most well-known model. If you look up reflective practice or reflective models, Gibbs is most likely going to be at the top of that list. Um, and uh, it was developed in 1988 to give a bit of structure um, to learning from experiences. And it looks like this. So as you can see, it's a cycle. So we start at the top um, with the description. What happened? What was the experience? What was the situation that happened? Give a, 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 as much detail as you want to or a brief overview, whatever is good for you. But essentially what happened? Then you move on to what thoughts and feelings were there that seemed significant? What seemed important to you? What emotions seemed strong for you? Um, were there any thoughts that you were having? What about before the experience, you know, while you were preparing or during the experience or particularly afterwards? What seemed significant to you and how did you feel in that moment, in that situation? Then you come on to evaluation. So you're thinking about the good parts and the bad parts. What went well? What could be improved next time? So just a, a simple sort of pros and cons list, if you like. And then you move on to analysis. So analysis is making sense of the situation. You're thinking about why. Why did these things happen? Why did, were the things that happened good? Um, why were the bad things that happened? Why did they happen? Why did I feel the way that I did in that situation? Or why was I thinking the thoughts that I was thinking in that situation? Making sense of the situation. Then you come on to the conclusion element. So what have you learned and what could you have done differently? You know, you're sort of summarising the analysis, summarising what you've made of that experience. Um, and in the action plan is the next stage and the final stage in this. Then you come to what will you do in the future? What can you what can you bring forward from this experience um, to do in future similar experiences? Good and bad. What can you do to bring that forward? So then uh, next time you have a similar experience, you can go around the cycle again and you can think of it. So that is the Gibbs model. That's a very brief outline, uh, but it's often quite helpful if we cover some examples in this. So 
Um, I'm going to go through an example, and the example that I'm going to use is the same for both models, just to give you kind of a different perspective on both. Um, it was uh, when I was working in substance misuse, I was uh, a client's key worker, and it became apparent that there were some safeguarding concerns. There was a five-year-old child at home, um, the child knew what a crack pipe was and knew what heroin was, um, knew not to touch the heroin or that she would be in trouble. Um, lots of really concerning stuff going on there that the child was bringing forward at school. So that's how the safeguarding concerns were, were raised. Um, so the client then disengaged further because we were up until that point, we were a helpful service to her. Um, uh, and then when you start talking to social workers about substance misuse, um, you, you very quickly get lumped into you're trying to take my children away, which is a very difficult thing. Um, the client is engaged, so I invited her for a decision point meeting. Um, and this is basically where we sort of have a discussion about what is going on. Why aren't they engaging? Let's make a plan for them to, to engage a little bit better. Um, and the partner attended. Um, and they all lived together in the house and he was just a little bit too charming. There was something a little bit too uh, nice about him. And I know that sounds really silly, but it was very forced. Um, he was also quite controlling. So immediately I was thinking, OK, maybe there's some domestic abuse situations going on here and maybe some coercive control or things like that. Anyway, really long story short, we went, you know, through the child in need, child protection route, um, lots and lots of child protection conferences and things like that. And um, the child was removed. Um, so when I'm reflecting on this experience, I am thinking about the whole experience. Yes, I could think about the decision point meeting, I could do a reflective model for that. Or I could think about the child protection conference that I went to, I could think about that. But at the time when I was doing this job, I wasn't using reflective models, I didn't know anything about it, I didn't really have huge amounts of supervision, I didn't have any clinical supervision. Um, so it was very difficult to, to do this um, with that. So now I'm out of it. I'm out of out of that role. Um, it's easier to look back on the whole experience uh, and reflect. But the particular aspect I'm I'm going to focus on is is the outcome. Is that the child was removed from the client, um, and the child was then adopted, um, with with no uh, contact order from from um, from the client. So she was not allowed allowed to talk to her child. So. That was a sort of brief description. And then I think about my thoughts and feelings. I felt really conflicted. I felt kind of relieved when it was over and I didn't have to continue working in that way. I felt guilty. Um, I felt drained. I felt very emotional. Um, and this isn't something, this isn't an experience that I've had in my own personal life. So it was draining in a different way and emotional in a different way. Um, but I also was very anxious. I was very anxious um, if I was doing the right thing, very anxious um, and nervous, and not very confident either. So those were the thoughts and feelings that seemed significant to me at the time. And then thinking about the evaluation, so the good and the bad. So the good bits for me, it was the outcome, the child was removed from harm. Um, you know, the, the decision to remove a child is, is a very length, it's a very lengthy process. It's not just a snap decision. A lot of the time, um, uh, there has, there has to be reason to believe that the, that child is in significant harm. And I think that child probably was, in, you know, at risk of quite significant harm. Um, so the child being removed and finally being safe, um, that was a positive for me. Um, I follow procedure um, in terms of what our policies were, uh, risk assessment policies, safeguarding policies, um, local safeguarding procedures were followed, you know, multidisciplinary team working was followed, all of all of that and risk management. Um, and, you know, wanting to be very selfish for a minute, it was really good experience for me. I'm really glad that I had that experience. Um, because it, it teaches you a different, a, yeah, it just teaches you quite a lot of things, um, which I'll come on to in a bit. Some of the bad things then, so the client disengaged completely from the service and was eventually discharged through disengagement, like completely, completely disengaged. Um, actually, she ended up complaining about me because she thought that I had it in for her because I was, you know, helping, helping the social worker and giving information regarding 
substance misuse and things like that but that's you know my duty I didn't really have a choice it was absolutely nothing personal um it, and I, th I think that hit me quite hard though that was a, a bad thing um also I had as I said very little supervision and absolutely no clinical supervision so that was another sort of bad aspect for me uh, but the worst aspect was definitely the client disengaging and um becoming a lot more risky and not having the support from services that that was just really hard to take um so let's move on to the bulk of this then the analysis why did I feel the way that I did why was I thinking the way that I was so in this I kind of thought about my social graces if you don't know this model it's by Burnham I definitely recommend you have a look at it um, I'm planning on doing a, a video about it um, and I'll link it in the comments if I've if I've done that video um, if I think about my social graces so this is like my demographics so my age my gender my class my religion my geography uh, my education all of that if I think about my social graces something about me as a woman finds it very difficult that a child is removed. And I think something in me um, finds that really hard as a prospective mother in the future. You know, the idea of a child not being with their mother. Yeah, that it just, it affects me and it makes me very emotional. So I think that's one of the reasons that I felt the way that I did and the reason for the conflict, because I knew that that child was not safe in that environment. And I wanted more than anything to be able to support that client, to make some really good changes and to keep that child safe. But unfortunately, we just weren't able to get there together. We just weren't able to do that. Um, so that's another reason that I kind of felt the way that I did and potentially felt guilty. Um, equally, I think I felt guilty because um, I had very little idea and understanding about domestic abuse. Um, Fortunately, in that role, I did develop and, and learn a lot more about domestic abuse and the, the, the support that's available. But at that time, I didn't. And looking back, I think, had we recognised that there was domestic abuse going on as well, um, I think that there might have been a different outcome, i.e. the client might have um, got a place in a refuge or a hostel or something like that and potentially um, would have been out of that situation and therefore more likely or more able to make changes. So there, there was this intention there, I think. Um, and a lot of that comes down to me not having supervision, really, and not clinical supervision anyway, um, because it wasn't part of the, the service delivery model. I mean, clinical supervision line management supervision yes like where where are you with this target so let's get this person discharged let's do the safeguarding alert because we've got to do five every month or you know whatever it is um but not clinical supervision um i think as well the reason that i felt so conflicted and anxious is because there wasn't a lot of support you know i didn't know i was fairly new to the role I didn't know who to trust almost um, and it was my own stuff about trust and supervisors and things like that that kind of that kind of came up there um, so that's that's an interesting thing that I learned from doing this reflection as well the knowledge that I had as I said I was fairly new to the role this was my first proper child protection child removal case I'd done quite a lot of safeguarding before but nothing ever to this extent um and this case is quite unique the social worker was incredibly incredibly uh dedicated uh and i think they had a slightly lower caseload so they were able to dedicate a little bit more time to the situation um so that is some of my analysis as to why i felt the way that i did and why things went well and why things went badly another thing that came up for me when i was doing this um in the analysis why did things go so badly wrong as in, why did our relationship break down? I think there's a few issues. Um, so in substance misuse, if I asked you to imagine someone who uses heroin, um, you lots of words, lots of images might come to mind. Um, really derogatory terms like druggy or addict or junky might come to mind. Um, it could be an image of somebody that is dirty, that is neglected. My point in this, um, is that we all in society, regardless of, of how well-meaning we are, us in society 
have a very dominant view of what these of who these people are and how valuable they are in society so there's a massive stigma with substance misuse um you know people that use substances it's their own fault um they just shouldn't use the substance like it's that easy um so i think the the stigma there means that um clients often have really bad trust issues with professionals because professionals are the ones that want to take your kids away professionals are the ones that want to change your lifestyle you know um so i think that was one of the reasons that our relationship broke down so quickly this was a client who'd been in the service a long time had had multiple key workers knew knew the system knew the game um and when her child was removed there was absolutely no way she was going to trust us again because she just she absolutely refused because she said you've taken my child away because I'm a heroin user not necessarily not necessarily at all the child was removed through a series of factors um but largely that heroin and crack cocaine were freely available in the house um, for the child to be able to access and that's just a huge physical health risk massive overdose risk but anyway, my point is um, that I think that's part of why the, our relationship went so badly wrong. So that's that's the analysis phase. So you see, see there, you get quite a lot of rich information and data you can kind of play with, you know, qualitative stuff that you can really think about. Um, and then I picked out some, some main things um, about in the conclusion. So I followed procedure, but I needed more understanding. I needed more experience. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience and therefore I needed more support and more supervision from from my colleagues and my supervisors, which I didn't really get. Um, equally, I didn't fight for that because I didn't know, I didn't want to be thought of as difficult. I was you know, trying to get on there. Um, so my action plan, what I would do um, in the future is ask for more guidance. I'd ask for more supervision and I'd do it in a loud, confident voice. Um, and that has helped me now in my current role um when i'm when i need help i will just say to my supervisor look i actually need help it's okay to ask for help um you are within your rights to do that and actually my management experience has helped me realize that it's my my job as a manager let's say to make sure that my staff are supported so you know on the on the flip side it's my manager's responsibility to make sure that i'm supported um and once i kind of made that connection in my head i found it much easier to ask for support so that is one example of gibbs okay that's just one example that i've chosen but i hope that kind of explains a little bit about the cycle that you use um and particularly the analysis section which is quite open um, you know, there's not any prompts or anything. It just says, what does, you know, what, how do you make sense of the situation? So that's, that can be a bit tricky sometimes, but what you want to focus on is why, why did that, why did I feel that way? And why did the things go well? Or why did the things go bad? So, um, as I say, let me know if you've got any questions, um, pop them in the chat and I will hopefully answer them as best I can. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. Just thinking about some of the positives and negatives about Gibbs. So I think it's really easy to use. I think it, it is clear. The model makes sense. You know, it is logical. Um, and it, because it's cyclical, um, you know, you can use it for repeated experiences. It's good for a really wide range of experiences. You can use it for basically anything. Um, I've used it for uh, a tricky supervision session. I've used it for assessments, for clinical work. I've used it for... Uh, reading a research paper, which was an interesting one. So uh, just thinking about what came up for me and um, and what I can do next time, because reading research is obviously really important in our in our roles. And also for me, um, it, it includes the good things. It includes the things that went well. It forces you to reflect on the things that went well. And us as aspiring clinical psychologists, we're not great at that. We always focus on the bad things, <laughs> what went wrong. Um, so having having a good uh, think about the good things is is important and as well it includes an action plan I love an action plan it's something in me that means I just like to have an action plan um, what I can do next time because then I feel like I've got real value out of the reflection some of the negatives some of the limitations I should say is it too shallow are there too few prompts wider theory and knowledge is not directly prompted either 
um, and is it too intermediate? So what I mean by that, is it too shallow? Um, you could do this very, very quickly. You don't necessarily have to go into a lot of depth, which could be seen as a strength as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, is it too shallow? Do, do you want something that's deeper? For example, the John's model, John's 2006, there is another webinar on that as well. Um, that gives you a huge series of prompts, loads of different questions to answer. So if you want something really deep, then maybe go for that. If you want something a little bit lighter, potentially, then go for this. Are there too few prompts, um, as, I, as I sort of just explained? And why do theory and knowledge is not directly prompted? Um, so uh, in some of the models, it says, you know, what are some of the uh, wider issues you can consider here? Um, you could include that in the analysis, um, like I did with the um, idea of sort of stigma and substance misuse issues. You could include that in the analysis, um, but it's not directly prompted again. So I think, you know, if you are experienced at reflection um, or feel able to prompt yourself into this, um then then go for it and is it too intermediate so are there too few prompts do you know if you need lots of prompts and lots of help getting through a reflection that's fine that's absolutely fine there are loads of models out there um but this uh yeah generally i i do think this is a good one um so i've actually had a question in so i'll i'll go for that one now thank you so much so the question is do you tend to use the models only following a difficult situation or are they useful to use at other times too great question that's really good um thank you for that um i so when i first started reflecting i would only focus on the things that i found really sticky is my way of, of describing it really uh really yeah tricky um, something that I felt stuck with, something that I found difficult. Um, there's value in that. Absolutely. There is definitely value in that. Um, now, because I'm slightly more experienced with reflection, um, I try my best to think about what the good things, what went well, what can I continue to do? So, for example, um, I have an online reflective group um, that I'm part of. And I did a presentation yesterday about substance misuse and mental health. Um, I think it went really well. I was really happy with it. Um, and I sort of did a bit of a reflection on that today. And I was thinking, OK, so why did it go well? One reason was that I prepared really well. You know, I practiced it. Um, I got all my materials ready. I knew what I was going to say. So that helps me. I can bring that forward and say, OK, well, when I do these webinars or when I do a presentation at work, um, I know that I like to be prepared. I like to feel prepared. Um, so that's that's an example of when something went well and I've applied it to future situations. So, yeah, you can absolutely, absolutely do them, um, it, you know, when things go well. And I think it's important to have that balance. Um, so including things that do go well, because, as I said, we are not good as aspiring clinical psychologists at saying that we've done things well. So, yeah, I would wholeheartedly um, encourage you to do that as part of your reflective portfolio as well. Um, if you want to know more about reflective portfolios, I will put um, the link for the um, video on reflective portfolios in the comments as well. Thank you for that question. So I'm going to move on um, to the Brookfield model. So um, this, as I said, came from education. So the idea behind this one was to help teachers become a little bit more critically reflective. Um, and it looks like this. So kind of very different from Gibbs, but don't panic. I will talk you through it. So let's start with the self. We have all these different domains. OK, so imagine um, imagine you have an experience, okay? You're looking at a lump of experience and it looks like a Battenberg cake. If anyone doesn't know what a Battenberg cake is, it, it basically looks like this if you cut it in half. Um, if you cut through it, a cross section of it will look like this. So you've got four different domains, okay? And what this helps you do is look at the cross section. You're just sort of dissecting the experience and having a look. That's kind of what you're doing. You're looking at it from a different angle with all of these different domains. All right. So with the self, it's our autobiographies as learners. What is our narrative? What did we learn from it? Um, how did we prepare? What was it that we learned, us personally or professionally? Then because we're in education, we look at students. What did our students see? So, for example, when I'm doing these webinars, I kind of 
loosely, I am not a qualified teacher, I loosely take on the role of a teacher. So I can think, okay, so when I get feedback from people on the webinars, that I'm kind of getting an idea of what their opinion is, what their eyes are saying, what they have learned. Um, so it's that sort of thing, really. And then we think about peers. So what did your colleagues think of the experience? What did, what were their perceptions of it? Um, what was their viewpoint? Um, and then we go on to scholarship, theoretical literature. So like I was saying, Gibbs doesn't have a particular prompt for theoretical literature. This one does. So you're starting to think a little bit about wider psychological theory. Um, you can interpret this however you want, kind of. Um, and that's kind of the beauty with reflective models. If you are interpreting it in a different way, reflect on that. Think about why that is. Um, for example, I think this can have value in clinical situations. Um, you just take out the student square and put in clients. So what did our clients um, think of the experience or their, their carers, their family members? What did, what did they think of the experience? What was their experience? So um, I do think that it can have value in clinical settings as well. But let's let's go through the example then. So you know the situation now. This is a client in substance misuse whose child was removed after a long, 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 long process um, and a lot of clinical intervention that went on. So what did I learn? Well, I had to learn safeguarding and child protection procedures on the job. Had to learn them as I went on. And, you know, I did have some support. I did have some supervision on that. Um, but I basically had to learn it from the social worker and, you know, from, from my colleagues um, rather than from, you know, training, which would have been quite helpful. Um, I had to learn how to use supervision and ask for it, ask for support. That was probably my biggest lesson that I got from that. Um, as I've said, and that was a retrospective lesson. Like I said, when I left, I realised, oh my God, now I actually have clinical supervision. I know how valuable that is. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, I know that I needed that, basically. Um, it was an experience that also I learned that no amount of reading about a subject can substitute for experience interpret that how you want I mean generally you know I, the experience that I had actually going through a child protection procedure and a child removal procedure um I, I learned much more I found it much easier to learn that way than you know reading case studies and, and learning that way um as well I learned about how, how to manage my emotions and to uh notice my own emotions um, and I learned that reflective models are useful. That was a, a lesson, again, that I learned retrospectively because I wasn't using models at the time. But now I know that they are so fantastic and it, I think I, it would have really helped me doing that at the time. So as I said, um, I substituted the student experience for clients. What did the client experience? Well, as I said, uh, I think she probably felt betrayed. Um, she probably felt angry. She probably felt conflicted, isolated, trapped, stigmatized, alone, angry. She probably felt a lot of things, um, some towards herself, some towards me, some towards the service, some towards her partner, some towards society and the system. Um, I think I think the way that I interpreted her experiences and, and her disengagement and her anger was that it was internalized and that she was actually then just uh, externalized sorry and that she was sort of projecting that anger onto me um and then you reflect and you think well is that because um is that because it's true or is it because she can't face she can't face it um but what this is helpful for is is actually kind of trying to sit in their chair for a while, you know, walk a mile in their shoes is what you're trying to think about. Because as well, as well as all of this child removal stuff that they had going on, they were in a potentially abusive relationship or, you know, controlling the um, relationship. They were having their child removed. They were also um, addicted to heroin, physically addicted to heroin and crack cocaine. And um, there was a lot of self-neglect going on. Um, and you know you know what it's like if you feel ill right you don't want to do anything you you can't physically do anything sometimes 
well that's how a lot of heroin users feel because they feel so unwell a lot of the time and it becomes very hard for them to engage so this really helps you it encourages you to think about what that client is experiencing what that family is experiencing um so i i do think that's really helpful moving on to peers then so my colleagues um my colleagues and supervisors were, were fairly congratulatory and sort of praising about about it, which kind of felt a bit weird and, and incongruent to me because I felt like I was ruining someone's life. I, I wasn't. I appreciate that now. But that's definitely how I felt. Um, some of my colleagues were glad that they didn't have to do that work. Um, I think some of my colleagues felt a little bit put out because they had been the client's previous key worker and not pushed on these issues not picked up on some of the issues um and some understood how emotional it can be um and some would, were able to provide some support so that's a, another thing because it helps you really think about what other people are going through in this experience as well you know it's not just you you're thinking in a kind of a more systemic type way um so i think there's there's real value in that and then moving on to scholarship what can psychological theory help me with? Well, loads of different theories you can apply to this. I think systemic is a, is a really good one for this particular reflective model, really looking at the systems in place, um, family systems, societal systems. Um, it can really help you think. Um, a theory that I'm really into at the moment is compassion focused therapy or CFT. Um, I so very briefly CFT posits that we have three brain systems we have threat which is um, focused on keeping us safe so you know making sure that we are safe from predators um, and then we have the drive system so once um, our physical safety needs are met then drive is um, everything else that we're driven to do you know our reward system and then we have soothing so soothing is all about um feeling connected to people what calms us down what um what what do we feel good about in life what makes us feel good um and connected to people so cft posits that you want all of these brain systems fairly balanced but what i think is happening here is that this client's threat system is huge all she can think about is um they're going to take my child away uh, I can't do this. I, I I can't use my heroin, but then I need to use because I can't cope, and it all becomes very overwhelming. Um, and equally with that, there's no soothing. There's no soothing because you know when you are a, a, a person that's used heroin for a long time, heroin becomes more of um, something that they have to do rather than a pleasure. So there's no soothing. There's absolutely none. There's, you know, lots of social relationships are destroyed. Family relationships are destroyed. Um, support networks through the systems that we work in, you know, the services destroyed. Um, so that's that's a way that you can look at it differently. You could also look at articles that were published uh, that have been published about mothers that have had children removed due to substance use and lots of other issues. Um you could think about um, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Have a little look at Felitti's ACE wheel. So what this means is uh, lots of different um, experiences that we have in childhood. So substance misuse, um, loss of a parent, that sort of thing. All of these things contribute. And um, if, you if you have experienced lots of these, then your uh, um, uh, outcomes aren't that great then that you know the the um, prognosis if you like isn't that great someone that's experienced a lot of childhood trauma and a lot of childhood issues is more likely to go on to suffer from mental health issues and things in the future essentially so that's another kind of psychological theory thing that you can apply to it you can get really creative with it you can really look at all the different sort of ways of looking at things um you can look at psychodynamic and transference. You could look at act and what, what our values are. What, what are my values? What are the client's values? What are my colleagues' values? Um, what are our societal values? You can really, you know, it's really broad. That is the beauty of it. But what this, what this situation, what this reflective model does is that it, it helps you understand things differently. It gives you lots of different prisms to look through the look at the experience through, so you can kind of see it differently and think about it differently. Um, 
And you can add a plan if you want to. What you could do is just think about, okay, well, what have I learned then? I've actually learned that maybe our service delivery model wasn't um, as effective as it could be. Maybe we could use a compassion focused approach. Maybe I could suggest that. Maybe I want to learn more about compassion focused. Maybe I want to learn more about theories. And you can make a plan yourself from what you get out of this. Um, but there's no sort of prescribed one. So that is the Brookfield model with an example as well. Um, as you can see, kind of two different models, but we will come on to a comparison in a minute. Firstly, let's think about a critique then. So some of the positives, um, it's good for a wide range of experiences. You know, you can use it for so many different things. You can use it for webinars, for presentations, for coursework that you've done and feedback you've received, interviews potentially, you know, when you've received feedback from an interview. Um, it gives you different viewpoints, as I've said, and it places us as learners rather than people who are experts, places us as learners. So that's really interesting. And wider theory is included. So I definitely think this is helpful for aspiring clinical psychologists because we need to be able to make theory practice links. So I think this is a really good one. Um, and it's one that I'm going to use a little bit more. So some of the negatives. Is it too open? Are there too few prompts? It is very unstructured. You know, it's not cyclical. Um, if you prefer something that kind of takes you back to the start, that back to a similar situation, and then you can run the reflective model again, then, then maybe this one isn't for you. Um, students can be a bit confusing sometimes. Um, and when I've tried to do this previously, when I first started doing reflection with, with models, I found it a bit tricky to, to understand what this meant. Um, but substituting it for clients, I do think works. And there's no plan section. As I said, I love a plan. But equally, um, I think I like a plan because uh, it sort of settles any discomfort I have about not knowing what to do with this information. And I always need to be doing something. Um, but this one is actually quite nice to just look at the experience and go, yeah, that's cool. That's what happened. That's what I learned from it. Great. Um, and as well, you can revisit it. So, so yeah. Thinking about comparison between the two then. So they are different. Um, you know, Gibbs is good for repeated experiences because it is cyclical. It can be quite a brief reflection, as can Brookfield. Um, there is a plan section included in Gibbs, but not in Brookfield. Um, not a prompted one anyway. Uh, Gibbs contains helpful prompts. Um, and Brookfield contains fewer prompts. But, you know, they are open. They are both very open. They're both good for different experiences. Um, and I've actually found this really helpful using two models on one experience um, because I do think different things came up for me doing both. So I'd, I'd recommend have a play, have a play around with them. Um, I will make sure as well I've got some templates. I'll make sure they're on the Facebook group. Um, comment below if you want me uh, to send them um, if you're watching the recording and uh, yeah message me and I'll, I'll send you some templates that you can use um, to put in your reflective portfolios and to really have a have a think with this stuff but it really depends on the situation as to which model you want to use um, and what you want to reflect on and what works for you as I said I like a plan so I tend to use one that has a plan section so we come on to the question and answer section I did have a couple of people send me some questions, so thank you for that. Um, if you've got any while I'm answering these questions, if you've got any more, pop them in the chat and I'll try my very best to answer them. So the first one that I've got is, I don't see the value in using reflective models. What else can I do to reflect? So thank you um, to the person that sent this question in. Um, uh, I think it's really bold to do that. <laughs> um, and I, I do understand what you're saying. Um, but for me, the initial thought I had was, it's an interesting reflection in itself. Why don't you see that value? What is it that you, uh, how do you feel about reflective models? Why do you feel that way about reflective models? Potentially use the user reflective model to help you. Or you could just ask yourself a series of questions. Why do I feel this way? What are my thoughts? What are my emotions? Um... Uh, have I been told anything before about reflective models? Have I been told to stay away from them? Have I been told a certain thing? Is that why you feel that way? Do some reflection on that itself is the first thing I would suggest. Um, but what you could do, you could develop your own model. 
you know, you could ask yourself whatever questions that, that make sense to you. You could also use journals or re freehand reflection. Um, you know, you could start by drawing a mind map of different things. You could start with um, your experience and then you could branch off into lots of different things that w seemed important to you at the time. Um, have another look at, through the reflective models, though, because there are lots and lots and lots. Um, and maybe, I suppose, if you are going to look again at the reflective models, maybe choose a really open one that doesn't have a lot of prompts, um, because then you can do with it what you want. Or equally, maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you want one that actually has quite a lot of prompts. Maybe you want one that is um, that helps you um, get, you know, guides you a little bit more. And that's fine. Go for that if you want to. You could also. So imagine you've got an experience. I always when I when I first started doing this would write the experience or the situation on a on a piece of paper, kind of like you're doing a formulation. You just put it in the middle, and then I had all these different branches that came off. And what I would do is think, OK, so what would a CBT approach think about this? What would a compassion focused approach think? What would an ACT approach? What would a CAT approach? What would all these different approaches think? Or you could think um, a year ago, how would I have acted in this situation? Um, or you could think uh, you could speak to your supervisor about it. See what they say. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, you don't have to use a reflective model, but I definitely would encourage you to, to think about why that is, if you find them tricky in some way, why that is. So my next question is, what is your favourite model to use when reflecting? Um, I don't have a good, well, I tell you what, I've gone through different, um, I've gone through phases. So when I first started, I was all about the John's model. I found that really, really helpful. But now I'm a little bit more practiced at it. Um, I find the Gibbs model really useful. But actually, in doing this webinar, I I'm really excited to try out the Brookfield model again, like to keep keep trying that one out, um, because I think that would be really helpful. But equally, it really depends on the situation as well. So if I, for example, if I'm reflecting on something where I felt stuck. I will use the Rolf et al. 2001 model because it has a specific section. Why do you feel stuck? What is it about the situation that's keeping you stuck? You know, whatever it is. So it really depends on the situation. But at the moment, Gibbs is my go-to. It tends to be my go-to. Um, but yeah, there are loads, loads and loads out there that you can have a go at. Any other questions from anybody? I haven't had any more sent in so far, so I'm just hoping that people will send some questions in if they want to. Um, the bottom line is, have a play. Have a look at all the different reflective models that are around. There are loads. Um, give it a go. That's the best thing you can do. Um, and then think about how that experience was for you. Um, think about, was the model easy to use? Did you? What did you think? Write your own critique disagree with me if you didn't agree then absolutely let me know that's that's fine okay i'm gonna move on haven't had any other questions come in so i will move on so in summary then reflective models can help you reflect in a new way can give you an alternative perspective on things gibbs and brookfield are two examples of reflective models um, and hopefully they will make a little bit more sense to you now so our upcoming webinars so tomorrow i am doing another one um it's a two webinar week this week um tomorrow at six o'clock uk time we are going to look at nhs assistant psychologist job applications terrifying isn't it i know but i'm going to give you some top tips on applying for assistant psychologist jobs um what you need to do what you need to avoid so make sure you tune into that one. Um, or if you're watching the record, then it should be available on my YouTube channel. I will make sure that I link it below. Now then, we also had a little vote for your December webinar, um, which is going to be at six o'clock on Thursday, the 17th of December, which will hopefully, well, probably be even colder outside. Um, and the topic is going to be a live Q&A. So uh, being an assistant psychologist, tips for getting AP interviews, applying to the doctorate, whatever you want to ask me. Um, if you've got any questions, um, pop them uh, pop them in the comments and I will make sure to include them on the Q&A. Um, but I really hope you can join me for those. 
Um, if you want to get involved on the Facebook group down there uh, on the UK Deacon Insight Applicants Reflective Space, there will be a unit where I will post the templates um, for, for the reflective models for you to use. Comments or questions are welcome on the Facebook group or on YouTube or on Insta or wherever you want to talk to me. That is great. I would really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much to everyone that's joined our online reflective groups. I've really, really enjoyed introducing everyone. Um, if you still want to get involved in an online reflective group, um, then uh, leave me a comment, send me a message, um, and we'll make sure that we get that sorted for you. Let me know in the comments what topic you want to hear. What do you want to know about reflective practice? What do you want to know about being an assistant, working in the NHS, what, trying to get onto the doctorate? What do you want to know? Let me know. And don't forget, you can follow us on all the social media. Um, click subscribe if you haven't already. That would be really great. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and here are some helpful resources. As I said, I will make sure I link all the videos below. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Oh, thank you for the lovely comment. That's really, really kind. Oh, great. I'm really glad that you guys have joined and you found it helpful. Let me know if there's anything you think I could do to improve. I'd really like any any, um, any support. That would be really great. And if you're watching the record, click some of the videos down below. Thanks, guys. Bye.